So our goal today is to look at the one that came to save me, save you, to look at him through the eyes of some of those that were in Bethlehem. Not, not all of those, but just some of those. Would you find in your copy of God's Word the text that Linus read this past week for the 52nd time? Charlie Brown Christmas was played for the 52nd time this past week, and Linus read Luke chapter 2. Find that text in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament, and in particular, find chapter 2. And I want us to read together just the first part of the Christmas story and imagine of those that were there what it looked like. Luke chapter 2. Scroll till you find verse 1. And when you find verse 1, tell your neighbor that I have found it. Not another book in the world like the one you're holding. Would you stand and allow for me to read just the first seven verses? From Luke chapter 2. The Bible says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Verse 3. And all went to be registered to each, each to his own town. And Joseph, verse 4 also went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. He went there to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, engaged wife, who was with child. I love the way the King James says, and was great with child. Verse 6, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Pray with me, would you? Father, allow us today, in the next few minutes that we have together, to be able to look through the eyes of those that were in Bethlehem and see the Savior, our Savior, the one that came to save us. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you and be seated. If you would, keep your copy of God's Word open. Forty years ago this year, I and three friends crawled into a Caprice Classic owned by Lucky Walker who lived in Baird, Texas. And we, y'all don't know Lucky, and I don't know if that was his given name or not, but that's what we called him. And we got out on Interstate 20, and we drove to Abilene, Texas. And we drove there to see the very first episode of Star Wars. Forty years ago, 1977, millions flocked the past week into theaters to see episode 8, The Last Jedi. Forty years that series has been running. CNN Money Magazine ran an article on why that movie has such good success. And a man by the name of Frank Pilata, who usually writes op-eds for CNN Money, but he wrote in that article his thoughts on why it has done so well. He says this, and I quote, because people are always looking for a new hope, a new force of good. At a time when the world needs heroes. Man, I thought about that. And I, I thought about how the night that Jesus was born, people were looking for a new hope. Looking for a new force of good when the world needed heroes. And in particular, one. When the world needed a Savior. And that Savior, we believe and you believe, was born in Bethlehem. I want you to think with me this morning for just a few moments about those that were there. Not necessarily the, the, 
the shepherds or the wise men that came a little later, not necessarily through the eyes of Mary and Joseph, but, but three distinct groups of people, groups of beings that were present in Bethlehem. And I, I want us for just a few moments together to imagine what they saw, what they believed, what they allowed to to be right in front of them and how they responded to it. I really want to make three statements this morning about three distinct groups. The first statement that I would make would be this, that the angels that were there, the angels most definitely believed in Jesus. Now, we didn't read about it in our text, but just look back at your copy of God's Word. The very next passage was one that you're probably most familiar with in the Christmas story. The part that says, and there were shepherds out in the field at night, and, and they, were, they were watching their flocks, and angels appeared to them, and, and lo and behold, the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and the angel said, don't be afraid, and, and, and for you today is born a Savior in the city of David, and, and then you know the story, the heavens were filled with angels, all shouting at the top of their lungs and, and saying, glory. To God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. Now, the angels, to to proclaim that type of message, had to believe in Jesus. They had to. there's, There's no way they could shout that at the top of their lungs and not believe in Jesus. And I believe that they believed in Jesus because mainly of this fact. They had seen him. The angels had seen Jesus. They they, they didn't see him as a babe. They saw him as he was in heaven. Because I believe that Jesus has been in heaven since the creation of time. In fact, if you were to go back to the very first chapter of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, you would find where there in verse 26, the Bible says these words. And God said, let us make man in our own image. In our image, let us make man. I believe with all my heart when he said those words, our, that he was talking about himself. He was talking about Jesus. And he was talking about all of the beings in heaven. I believe they all together, angels from from one end of heaven to the other, had seen Jesus. And I would say to you that they believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was real. Now, we have to connect ourselves to everyone in this story to include the angels because there's not a one of us in this room that had ever seen Jesus in the flesh. We haven't. Boy, Debbie's song while ago singing about Bethlehem and from Mary's perspective. Can you imagine being the mother of Jesus and seeing with your own eyes this, this baby that you gave birth to that you know was was from on high, was, was divine in nature, to be able to see it with your own eyes. But we don't share that, for we have not. But I am going to ask you this. I'm going to ask you this. Do you, do you truly, this morning, believe in Jesus? There's two of us in this room this morning that believe in Jesus, because that's really all I heard. Let me try it again. My mic may not. We're having trouble with our PowerPoint Mike, don't worry about it. Everybody just check this out right here. This morning, right now in Christmas Eve 2018, do you really believe in Jesus? Yes. Nah, that's, that's a little more like it. That is. That's a little more like it because I, I think we can relate to the angels. I haven't seen him. I haven't but I know him. I haven't seen him, but I know his story. I haven't seen him, but I know what he did for me. I haven't seen him, but I know his love. I haven't seen him, but I've seen his power. I haven't seen him, but I've seen him at work all around us. I haven't seen him, but I've seen people that are so, so surrounded by the presence of Jesus 
that I believe I've seen the hands and feet of Jesus at work. I haven't seen him, but I know him. Have you ever had anybody walk up to you and say, hey, do you know old so-and-so? And and you kind of go in your mind and you start thinking, yeah, that sounds familiar. And you start tracing back at maybe where paths could have crossed. And you kind of work through the process of, 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 yeah, I've, 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 I, I think I know that person. Well, there ought to be a place in mine in your life to where if I were to say, do you know Jesus, that you would say, yeah, yeah, I do. I, I can go back to where I met him. I can go back to where he, was, he became real to me. I can go back to where, although I didn't see him with my eyes, I saw him for the very first time. I knew who he was and and I'd realize what he had done for me. We ought to be able to go back in time to when, when we see Jesus. So the angels definitely believed in Jesus. Let me make a second statement, and I'll tie the two together. The second statement would be this. The innkeeper might have believed in Jesus. Now, that's different than saying the angels definitely believed in Jesus. That statement is the innkeeper might have believed in Jesus. Now, let's talk about the inn for just a second. And, and in fact, uh, you know as well as I do, Christmas story and pageants and plays and dramas uh, always have an innkeeper saying what? There's no room in the inn. Well, that's not in Scripture. It's really not. In fact, the only thing that's mentioned is that there was no room in the inn. And, and that word inn there... It's certainly not a Marriott, certainly not a, a, even a, a La Quinta or a, a, a Best Western, not even a Motel 6, not even It'll Do Motel. Have y'all ever seen the It'll Do Motel? Next time you go to Colorado, if you drive uh, up uh, 287, you'll pass by the It'll Do Motel. I had the pleasure of staying in the It'll Do Motel before it was even named It'll Do Motel. Uh, this, this inn that Luke tells us about was more than likely a house with a couple of extra rooms where as many people as possible would have crammed in without electricity, without an inside bathroom. There would have been a common area where as many people as possible laid down close enough to the fire that they felt the heat in a smelly, sweat-filled room with people going on days and days and days journey just to have a place to get out of the elements, to, to rest for just a few moments. The room probably, probably reeked with the smell of the evening meal with as many bodies as could possibly fit. Oh, there were no motels in Bethlehem. It would have been a house that someone made a couple of, a, a couple of bucks just leasing out spots. But two things had to happen. Two things had to be said. One was this. Somebody had to say there is no room in the inn. That, now we don't have that in our text, but somebody had to. Because Luke chose to remind us that there was no room in the inn. So somebody had to. Now, whether that person, uh, he or she, whether they, whether they knew who Mary and Joseph were, we don't know. Whether they saw Mary, a great with child, pregnant, and, and, and even in the, the beginning stages of labor, probably in pain. Whether we know they, they saw her or not, we have no idea. But at some point, somebody had to tell Joseph, there is no room here. He had to hear those words. Now, equally, equally though, number two, somebody had to say, there's room in my manger. There's room in my my pen. There's room in 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 my cattle staging area. There's room in my cave where I keep my my barn animals. Somebody had to say, there's room in my manger. 
because we know that Jesus was born and, and he was born in a manger and he was laid in a, a feed trough in something that probably had hay in it, we know that somebody had to say, I've got a little room out there. And we don't know if that person went out there with them. We don't know if they might have even assisted with the delivery of baby Jesus. We don't know if, if all they did was just say, hey, you can stay out there for a couple of bucks and, and, and help yourself. It's all that we've got. But somebody, somebody had to say there's no room in the inn. And somebody had to say there's room in my manger. Now, how do we connect with, with those two people? Well, I, I guess I would ask you this question. Today, I would ask you, is, is there room in your heart for Jesus? Not is there room in your inn. Uh, you may own an inn. I don't know. And, and not is, is, is there room in your manger. You, you may own a manger. I don't know. I'm, I'm not asking those two questions. Somebody's already answered those. My question to us this morning is, is there room in your heart? Because that, that's where Jesus wants to be. Now, there's no way, never, will I believe that Joseph wanted Mary to give birth to Jesus in a manger. In fact, I say that would be the last place on earth. This past week, a group known as the Economic Intelligent Unit, they conduct surveys, and they put out each year the best places to be born. That was released this past, uh, this past week. Uh, they took numerous quantitative uh, metrics to determine the best countries that where it would be to be born, quality of life indices, uh, happiness metrics, uh, and they predict the, the greatest place for a child to be born today to hopefully have a healthy, safe, and prosperous life. In 1988, the United States was the place hands down leaps and bounds away from the rest of the world. In 1988, the United States was the place to be born. We don't even make the top five now. We don't even make the top ten now. In fact, uh, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Australia, and Switzerland are the top five places to be born. The United States, a baby right here, 16th. In, in the world orders of the best place to be born, according to that group. Uh, Nigeria, for many years, is still last. That night, the manger would have been below Nigeria. It was the worst place in the world for a baby to be born. And we don't even know if the innkeeper believed I would I would ask you this before I go on I would ask you this you, you, you believe in Jesus we agreed on that is there room is there room in your heart for, for Jesus today allow me to come back to that if you would because I want to point out just one other thing from our text one other thing I want to I want to say this that most people that night, didn't have the chance to believe. Most people that night in Bethlehem didn't have the chance to believe because they didn't know. They had no clue. Life was carried around. Uh, it's been estimated that there might have been a million people in Bethlehem about that time. Imagine it this. What if, if all of us on April the 15th, to, to pay our taxes, we all had to travel up to, to, to Washington and, and we all, you couldn't pay them early. You had to wait and do it on, on April the 15th. And we all had to go to Washington. Well, there would be no room in any motel or any inn. No room for anything. That's, that's what Bethlehem was like. And most people had no clue that there was a baby being born in a manger. They had no idea that the king of kings was laying in a stable. Every time I read this story... I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm gripped by the vast majority never knew. Hey, let me make three statements. Will you allow me to do that about people that don't know? The first statement I would make would be this, is that the world is full of people that have never met Jesus. They're, they're, this, the world is full of people that have never, ever 
heard the name Jesus that have never, ever, ever even seen him. Hey, watch this video, would you? Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas, guys. Wanted to say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year from the Amazon jungle in Brazil. Also wanted to check in and kind of give you guys a quick update on some things going on here uh, in the Amazon. Now, first, we actually have a group out right now. As you're watching this, they are upriver in this Venezuela working with some people uh, of their people group and some communities doing some evangelical work. So we're pretty excited about that. It's, uh, it's, some, it's a group from my, my local church. And so uh, I continue praying for them that they can uh, plant seeds and, and uh, see those seeds grow. And uh, we look to, forward to seeing hopefully a church planted up there in the Venezuela off the Rio Negro. Uh, number two is we are really excited about 2018 because we are partnering with uh, about six uh, young young uh, men and women to be gospel carriers, train them up to be gospel carriers. And so we're working hard to work with a, a couple of local churches to form a group, a core group of uh, young men and women that we can train up uh, in theology and doctrine and missiology uh, to be uh, gospel carriers and to plant churches, successful plant churches, um, uh, up on the river that we're trying to target. Of There's no gospel uh, presence up there. There's no church up there. And there's no known believers that we know of on this part of the river. And so we're really excited about, about getting up there and getting these, these young indigenous men and women uh, to plant churches on this part uh, of the Amazon jungle. So if you would, uh, if you would pray for us uh, for next year as we kind of see our strategy uh, go into action and, and plant these churches and train up these young indigenous uh, men and women to be gospel carriers. Again, just want to check in and say uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And we look forward to seeing all of you uh, in July of 2018 as we uh, have our first state side. Again, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Bye. Merry. The two youngest ones really do act like me, okay? I, they do. They get that from me. That's my kids and my grandkids. And I, and I showed you that not uh, for any other reason except to, to show you this, is that there's proof that there's people today in 2018 that have no idea who Jesus is. I've been on that river that they're talking about, the Il Negro. I've, I've been in a boat. I, I went on a, a trek up that river, and I, I met people, and I met children that have no idea who Jesus is. They have no clue that he came and, and was born in a manger to Mary and Joseph that the shepherds came, the wise men came. They have no clue that, that he lived a perfect life. They have no clue that, that he was falsely accused and, and sentenced to death. They have no clue that he was beaten beyond recognition and hung on a bloody cross for their sins. They have no clue. So we can, we can relate to this part of the story that that there were thousands there that missed Jesus. They missed him. He was born in their town, and they never met him. The world is full of people that have never met Jesus. A second statement I would make would be that you and I have the opportunity to make a difference in our world. I have, I have the opportunity to make a difference in mine. You have an opportunity to make a difference in yours. I, I might not be able to go to Brazil or to where Ashley, now so many of you texted me this week, emailed me this week and called me this week, tell me how good it was to hear Ashley's voice last week from, from Niger, Africa. Uh, we may not be able to go there and do that, but I can make a difference in my world. I can make a difference in the, in the people that I see and the people that I meet and the people that live around me. I can, I can at least make sure that they know and you and I can do the same thing. I, I, here's one of the things that I really love about Christmas. I love this fact about Christmas, that it is almost popular to say that you believe in Jesus. That's usually in, a, in a, a negative way based off of uh, commercialism and materialism, but we don't mind saying that we believe in Jesus. Hey, I would challenge us. Let's Let's talk about Christ after Christmas. We're talking about him now, but let's talk about what he did after. I would say to you that I can make a difference in my world and you can make a difference in your world right here in Longview, in White Oak, 
in East Mountain, in Kilgore, in, in wherever you may live in this area, Gladewater, around, wherever you may live, I would say to you that you can make a difference in your world. We can't go back and make a difference there, but we can make a difference here. Third statement, and I'm almost done. Third statement would be this, that there is room in my heart for Jesus. And I think you're here today because there's room in your heart for Jesus. I don't think, I don't think you came here to waste time. No, I know. Everybody's here for a different reason. Some of you are here today because that's just what you do. Some are here today because you were told to be here. I'm just saying that I believe every one of us here today has room in our heart for Jesus. Hey, God gave me this verse, and I, I argued with God just a little bit because it didn't fit with Christmas, I thought. And God gave me another one of those things that he said, I'm not interested in what you think. I'm interested in what you say. Say this. So this verse is what I'm supposed to say today. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, I want you to notice something because it talks about time. And it talks about the importance of time. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, For God says, At just the right time, I heard you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, look at what it says. The right time is now. Now, notice. And I challenge you to look at your translation, whatever your favorite one is, and see if it ends the same way, because it does. They all say, today is the day of salvation. None of your translations say tomorrow. None of your translations say next week. None of your translations say it as a, a New Year's resolution. All of your translations say the exact same thing, today is the day of salvation. Now, you'll know this beyond a shadow of a doubt, so answer it in the way that I ask. You, you'll know this. You won't have to think about it. You're not going to have to go, oh, it's a trick question. I don't do that. Y'all know me well enough. You're going to know this immediately, and I'm going to ask you to answer it with a, a visual response. If Jesus Christ is in your heart right now, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Put it down. You didn't have to think about that. You didn't have to go, oh, I don't know, I, I don't know. Because if he is, there was a time when you made room for him. He didn't bust his way in. Hey, this was, the, this was the king of kings being born. God could have opened up a house. God could have busted open the best uh, hospital in the area for his only begotten son to be born. He didn't. Jesus' his earthly father just went around and said, can we come in? And time and time again, the earthly response was, I don't have any room. I would say to you, God does that to each of us. There was a time in your life when, when God came to you and said, can I come in? Can my son come in? He didn't beat his way in. He didn't force his way in. He just asked, can I come in? And you responded by saying, please come in. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Come into my heart and live. There is room in our hearts for Jesus. There's, there's room in your heart. And if you're here today and Jesus isn't in your heart, you're the only reason I've stood before you for the last 19 minutes. You're the only reason. Because I wanted to get to the point to where I could say, he wants to come into your heart. He's not going to beat his way in. He just wants you to ask him. Just ask him to come in. That's what he wants. Let me make a fourth statement. Not planned, but let me make a fourth statement. My fourth statement would be this, and it's our takeaway. It's what I'm going to challenge you to take as you leave. Is that Jesus wants to give you peace as a Christmas gift this year. Jesus wants to give you something. Now, I know tonight, tomorrow, gifts are coming, gifts are going, and you've put a lot of thought into gifts you're going to get, and hopefully others have put thoughts in gifts that you're going to receive. I like my socks, best of all, from our children right here. But Jesus wants to give you a gift today, and it's the gift of peace. He, he just wants today to give you peace. You know, Isaiah, many years before Jesus was born, he prophesied and he, he spoke about Jesus coming and he said, the one that's going to be born will be called a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, 
and a prince of peace. I would say to you that if you don't have Jesus in your heart right now, that you really don't have true peace. Uh, If you want that peace, let him give it to you. Well, Donnie, I've got Jesus in my heart, and I still don't have peace. Oh, I, I get that. I do. I get that and understand that. I would say to you that he wants to give it to you right now. He does. Robert Morgan, in his book, Worry Less and Live More, he illustrated something that I did not know. Amazon, the one that <laughs> I ordered a Christmas gift this year for one of my children, and, and they promised me it would be delivered day before yesterday. Promise, guaranteed. No question, guaranteed it'll be here day before yesterday. The earliest that I'm going to see it is Tuesday. I spent two and a half hours the other night on the phone with Amazon asking them, what do I tell the person that I was getting that gift for? What do I tell my youngest son about his gift? I didn't have peace the other night. Still a tad bit bitter about it. Can you tell? (laughs) Robert Morgan in that book, uh, Worry Less and Live More, he enlightened me to something about Amazon. If you've ever ordered an e-book, if you've ever ordered anything electronic that you read from Amazon, they have the ability of tracking what you highlight in that book. I've got several ebooks, several Bibles that I've ordered through them, electronic Bibles. They, uh, they, they are able to tell what you highlight, and they, they put it out there. And it's not just books that you would think. I mean, books like The Hunger Games or the Harry Potter series or Pride and Prejudice. Uh, any book that you order, that you order electronic, they have the ability to track that. Uh, if you've ever bought a Bible like I have, they have the ability of tracking what you highlight in that Bible. Now, when I read that, I thought, well, I bet bet that John 3.16 is the number one highlighted verse. It wasn't. Didn't even make the top ten. I thought Psalm 23. What's what's better than Psalm 23? Surely that is. It's not. It was actually, according to his data, it was this verse. From Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. This was the most highlighted e-verse from the Bibles sold through Amazon. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And uh, say it with me, peace of God which transcends all understanding, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I told you that, number one, to kind of be scared of Amazon. Watch what you buy because they're watching. And if they guarantee it, be careful. (laughs) Just saying. But I told you that, secondly, to remind you that there's peace. You can have peace this Christmas. I think God wants to give it to you. Donnie, you don't know what I'm going through. I don't, but he does. Donnie, you don't know what I've been through. I don't, but he does. Donnie, you don't know how big. I don't know. I just know how big God is. Except peace. But Donnie, that, that, verse, is for, that verse is for, you know, those other people. Those people that kind of got it figured out. I, I, I would get that if it weren't for many people, but especially one uh, did uh, have y'all heard of the name uh, Kalani Neva? Have y'all heard of her, of, of Kalani? Uh, this past weekend, the Strawn Greyhounds won a Division Two, Six A State Football Championship. They they beat uh, the. Uh, the Balmora Bears, 78 to 42. 
uh, Kehlani Neva, uh, five foot, two and a half inches tall, is their kicker. She kicked nine extra points in the state championship game. Scored 18 points for her team. She's the first young lady to play at that level in a state championship. I've watched videos of her kick. She's amazing. Oh, she's, she's strong. She, she is. She did. And, and I, I know, I mean, you'd say, well, Donnie, she, she's unique. She's different. She's gift. I would say, too, she just put her place in a position to be able to do what she was supposed to be doing. And I would say to you that that verse that says, in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That verse was meant for you. Look at the person beside you and say, that verse was meant for you. Tell that person right now. So if you don't get anything else today, if, you, if you've missed anything that I've said in the last 22 minutes, catch this. God wants to give you peace this Christmas. Just open it up. Accept it. Say thank you. Give him all your problems. And worship and adore the one true king. Like only a handful did in Bethlehem that night. Would you stand with me, please? And if you would, just, just bow your head right there, just right where you are. Two questions. Two questions. First question is this. Man, do you have Jesus in your heart? You know, he's, if he's there, you know it. He, he's there because you ask him there. Do you have Jesus in your heart? If you don't have Jesus in your heart, in just a few seconds, I'm going to ask you to, to, to step out of your, of your aisle, and I'm going to ask you to, to come forward. I know, Christmas Eve, that's what I'm asking. Because today was created just for you. Because today is the day of salvation. So if you, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, in just a second, I want you to come and I, I want to visit with you. For just a few seconds. But my second question is, do you have that peace? That peace that passes all understanding. That peace that you know is available, but you just don't have it right now. Somebody just told you that sitting beside you that that verse was for you. You can trust them. They meant it. They love you. They just told you that verse was for you. So, Almighty God, I pray that in the few minutes that we have as we close this service on Christmas Eve, Father, I pray that if there's one person here that does not have room for Jesus in their heart before today, but today they want to make room for him, I pray that today will be their day of salvation. But Father, I pray that every one of us will leave this place today receiving from you peace, your peace. Not the peace that the world gives us, but the peace that Jesus gives us, the peace that passes all understanding. So, Father, please work through our hearts in this moment of time, created just for this purpose. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Patsy's going to play. I'm going to ask you a favor. If you've never met Jesus, would you just step out? The people beside you understand. I promise. You're not going to bother them. They understand. Just step out and come forward. Because I just want to share with you how you can ask Jesus to be your Savior. You may be here today and you want to pray about something. Something's heavy on your heart. You don't understand what's going on. You certainly don't have peace about it. But, but you want to leave here with peace. Just pray right there where you are. Come forward. I'll pray with you. you pray at the altar. That peace is there. That, that gift is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. Waiting on you to open it up and, in, and receive from him peace that will pass all your understanding. If God has placed upon your heart today something to turn over to Him, just turn it over to Him. You step forward if God's got a, a special purpose for you being here today.
as God is, is moving in, in our service during this time, I'm going to ask you to do something very quietly, very reverently, but just something that you can do. Uh, if there's somebody b- close to you, beside you, that you love and, and that loves you, just put your arm around them, reach over and grab their hand. Tell them that you love them. Quietly and reverently, we're still in the invitation time. Christmas is a great time to just say that we love each other. To say that we're blessed to have you in our life. And you can tell that person that. Just tell them that you're blessed. That they're part of what makes your life so special. Amen. Let me have your attention for just a second. You've told those right there close to you that you love them. But there may be somebody in this church that uh, they're just special to you. They've meant something to you. They've made a difference in your life. Before you leave, before you leave, you're, you're getting out early enough. You're going to beat everybody to the restaurants if, if that's where you're going. If you're going home to roast And carrots and potatoes and gravy, can I go with you? (laughs) You'll have time to do all of that. Don't miss a chance today to tell somebody that you go to church with that they're special to you. Give them that gift. It'll be a beautiful, beautiful gift that they receive from you this Christmas. It's been great to worship with you today. My prayer, the prayer that I prayed over, if you're a member of this church, I prayed this prayer over you this week. I went through our entire church row and I prayed this prayer over you this week. And it's our benediction this morning. I will tell you, Merry Christmas. I will tell you, uh, thank you. Thank you for allowing uh, us to have the opportunity to, to serve and worship with you. As a beautiful gift, and we are grateful. I prayed this over you, and I pray it over you now, that the Lord will bless you and that he'll keep you, that the Lord will make his face shine upon you and that he will be gracious to you. I pray that the Lord will lift up his countenance to you and that he will give you, say it with me, peace. May God bless you. We're dismissed.